So thanks for joining us for this evening's event here at Powell's Books. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you you can check out uh, you can check out us out on all forms of social media, including Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, and Facebook. So you can check out you can also check out our enticing lineup of events by going to our website at Powell's.com. Starting this Friday with the author Elisa Shua Dusapinen in conversation with Megan O'Connell. We will be having our stores in live and at the, that will be at the Burnside location. And uh, we will continue to have our, in, our online and in-person events. Um, Lydia Kiesling will also be joining us next week on April 7th in converse, uh, the conversation partner with Chloe Cooper Jones um, at, on April 7th at 7 p.m. at the Burnside location. So when looking at the events page, please note whether uh, the event is a Zoom location or, want, or a location at our other store so you don't um, be disappointed by going to a store or missing something. So tonight we are thrilled to welcome author Susan Strait in conversation with Lydia Kiesling. Susan Strait is the author of the memoir, in the Country of Women. She has been a finalist for the National Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the National, and the National Magazine Award. She's the recipient of the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement, Achievement from the uh, Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Edgar Award for Best Short Story, the O'Henry Prize, the Lannan Literary Award for Fiction, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Tonight, she'll be talking about her newest novel, Mecca. In Mecca, the celebrated novelist crafts an unforgettable American epic, examining race, history, family, and destiny through interlocking stories of a group of native Californians all gasping for air. With sensitivity, furor, and a cinematic scope that captures California in all its injustice, history, and glory, she tells the story of the American West through the eyes of the people who built it and continue to sustain it. So she'll be joined in conversation by uh, Lydia Kiesling, the author of The Golden State. <laughs> and uh, tonight's event will include an, an audience Q&A portion. So please ask questions in the Q&A box below instead of the chat so that Lydia will be able to find them faster. If you see any questions that you'd also like to know the answers to, please click the like button so she will know that it is a question that isn't to be missed. Um, I'll, I'll be, uh, during, in, in a moment, I'll be dropping links to both Susan and Lydia's books in the chat during the event, so be sure to click on those events to support them and support Powell's books. So now, uh, please give me a, give us give a warm welcome to Susan Strait and Lydia Kiesling. Hey. Hi. Hi, Susan. Um, hey. Thank you, Nick and Powell's, for that lovely introduction. and. Thank you, Susan, for visiting us here in Portland um, virtually and for doing this event with us. I am trying to pretend like I'm not sitting on my bed, um, but I am failing. So yes, I am on my bed. I do not have a very good, um, beautiful white wall uh, as Susan does, um, but I am so excited and nervous to do this event with someone who is just one of the true pros, um, such a beautiful writer. I've had the pleasure of um, doing a, an in-person event with Susan before for her memoir. And I just admire her so much and admire Mecca, this beautiful novel so much. And I hope that um, all of the attendees will purchase your copy um, from Powell's. Um, so it's, it's just a gorgeous book. I'm gonna ask well, a housekeeping thing. Um, if you have a question as we're going along, as Nick said, drop it in the Q&A. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session to drop it in. If, it, if something occurs to you, put it in there and um, I'll check on it every once in a while. Um, I guess I was thinking of starting just, just a sort of introducing the book a little bit, but then asking Susan to read um, for us from, and she's going to read, I think, from the beginning. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, this is your ninth book for adults, um, but your 11th book total. Um, so not your, not your first rodeo. Um, you are one of the great writers of California and America. Um, and this novel, for those of you who haven't, in the audience who haven't had the pleasure of reading it yet, um, it, 
it is truly a sweeping book. Um, it's kind of hard to actually describe. <laughs> Nick did a wonderful job. Um, but it is about people whose, whose communities in California overlap, but also their lives overlap in the plot that Susan very meticulously and beautifully constructs for us, um, but also lays out how these communities are, exist in the history of California, their context in the, in the space of Southern California, um, and just how they negotiate where they live and yeah, their lives kind of link up and, in these really amazing um, and complex ways in the story that Susan has made. So um, Susan, if you could read from your PDF, Susan Traveled Light with, <laughs> with her digital copy and she's going to read for us. It's embarrassing to, um, to say that, yeah, I have to, I have to like read from, from my PDF, but Actually, that way I don't hold the book up in front of my hand, so <laughs> maybe it's better. I'm really thrilled to be with you, though, Lydia, because you know California. Like, I was so excited that you were willing to do this because, I mean, you know, you know our California, right? <laughs> and you know it's a big place, and yet, like, if you live in the same community, like, everybody knows everybody else. And one thing when I started this book was it was about the freeways. And people are always like, oh, the freeways, that's such a cliche. But where I live in inland Southern California, um, the truth is everyone has to be on the freeway all the time. You know, they work for Amazon Warehouse. My neighbor Jose works for Cisco Warehouse during the day. He comes home for a couple hours to eat. And then at night he works for the Petco Warehouse. Yeah. So the other day he stopped by and he's like, Miha, I paid $6 a gallon for gas. Like this is killing me. And you know, he was like, I took the 57 to get home. The freeways for us are like rivers, Lydia, right? I was just thinking about, about that. So. I'm gonna read you from uh, the prologue a little bit. And my main character in this part is Johnny Frias. And I have to tell the people in the audience that Johnny Frias is based on so many of the guys that I still hang out with every day. Like I still hang out with guys I went to high school with. You know, last week I was in a warehouse where guys restoring a classic 55 Chevy Bel Air. And then there's some street racing guys in there. And you know, then my husband went out with his motorcycle on Sunday and wrote on this dirt track and talked about that. So I'm, I'm writing about this guy named Johnny Frias and I've been writing about him for eight years now. And he is old school, Mexican American, like seventh generation, and he's a California high patrolman. So this is um, the beginning of his section. The wind started up at 3 a.m. the same way it had for hundreds of years. The same way I used to hear the blowing so hard around our little house in the canyon that the loose windowsill sounded like harmonicas. The old metal weather stripping played like the gods pressed their mouths against the screens in the living room where I slept when I was growing up. After I got off work this morning, the wind took a break and I was knocked out for a few hours, waking up in my triplex to hear Rose Sotelo's radio next door playing ranchero music, tubas and trumpets thumping against the stucco, her canaries worried in their little songs. But now that I was back on shift, the Harley was pushing harder against the big gusts, the Santa Ana's blowing crazier than ever, the way they did in the afternoons, feared from the nap. Brazilian pepper trees, the ones that grew in every vacant lot or frontage road area along the 91 and the 55 freeways, they had these long branches, like ferns or seaweed. And when the wind blew them sideways like skirts, I could see homeless encampments under a lot of the trees. A Thursday in October, Santa Ana winds, 94 degrees, fire weather. People were three layers of pissed off. Everyone hated Thursday. Wednesday was hump day, but Thursday was when people drove like they wanted to kill each other. Today, everyone was thinking of Halloween. Women wondering what sexy costume to wear for parties now that grownups had taken over the holiday. The men pissed that the Dodgers had lost even though they were supposed to be the boys of October. And now baseball season was over. The kids already tired of shit of school and practice. And then the wind. Every few minutes, dust and trash flew across the lane. The fall winds always made me think of my mother, holding me tight in the old redwood chair my father had tied to the porch railing up in Fuego Canyon, while the Santa Anas blew in the black night when they always started. My first memory. My mother talking to me before dawn, 
the gusts so strong, it felt like our house would go rolling down the canyon like a tumbleweed. The horses snorting in the barn, and my father down in the orange groves, making sure the trees didn't dry out. Nothing else is for sure but the wind, my mother would say, while the eucalyptus leaves and bark flew past us. We might not get rain, mijo, for a whole year, but we always get the santanas. My mother loved the wind, but she knew the flames would follow. And it wasn't just that she was watching for fire. She would hold me tight and say, we're gonna look out for smoke right now. I'm sorry, we're gonna look out for smoke, but right now, it's like we're in the ocean. Look at this, Johnny. But today, I was looking at one box truck that had blown over on an exit ramp near Corona, an overturned big rig up near the Chino Hills and downed branches on most of the surface streets. The famous wind named for right here where I drove every day, the Santa Ana Canyon, carved out by the river through mountains all along Southern California, hot as hell under my helmet. I hope that's enough, Lydia. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, we I also wrote a book about California, but but I don't know anything about Southern California. And actually, when we did that event together, that was one of the first times that I have been to Los Angeles, been to Southern California. But I drove down um, by myself, and I, it was like it felt like paradise. Like I just I was so enchanted by it and that's one of so you know I'm it's a place that I knew nothing about and I feel like your novel gives me a way to see parts of it that I I would never see otherwise um and and that's you know both geographic and just about different communities because it's such a like a vast just geographic location um and so many people live there and so many different kinds of people live there all together um so I guess I wanted to ask, it's, I'm interested to hear that you've been writing Johnny for eight years. Um, and so Johnny, um, as she said, is a California Highway Patrol officer. He introduces the book. It's actually, it's an amazing way to, to um, start things in the novel because you meet just various characters through him, just the people he sees pulling people over in his line of work. Um, but one of the magical things about the novel is that you, you're reading first and you're like, this is Johnny's novel. This is his story. And then you switch. And then it, and Susan so deeply um, brings other characters at sort of the main focal point of her narrative. And so I'm, I'm curious just how you, A, how you managed all of these narrative threads at once. Who came first? Who felt like the focal point to you as you were starting? Or if you love all your children equally <laughs> in this, in the novel. Um, and yeah, just, how do you, how do you, from a craft standpoint, manage so many strands? It's so fun to talk. It, it's nice to talk about craft. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you, I just finished writing an essay for Lit Hub about Louise Erdrich. Um, Louise Erdrich's Love Medicine was a book that I read when I was really young. You know, I was like 20 years old and I found a short story of hers in the North American Review, which, you know, a literary magazine. And I was in college. And I mean, my mom and dad didn't get to graduate from high school. So there I was, and my mom was an immigrant and you know, English was her second language. So I just had this strange way of thinking about English too. And that's something I wanted to write about with Johnny. Like so many of my friends, they speak Spanish and English, Spanish and English together, or people speak black vernacular or people speak Cambodian mixed with Spanish, mixed with English. But really what I wanted to say is it was like, how do we speak American? Like what's the, California American version that that I was that's what I was thinking about and so I went back and thought about Louise Erdrich has been writing about the same characters for all these years and really Johnny Frias came to me eight years ago Jimena came to me eight years ago Madalas is part of an earlier trilogy I wrote and her um, grandfather uncle who sort of raises her Enrique He's a guy I've been writing about forever, girl. He was in Between Heaven and Here, and they all came from Louisiana and ended up in California. So I'm always trying to write about how people end up in California as like the, the promised land. And it's really fascinating right now that everyone's sort of saying, oh, California's not the promised land anymore, everyone's leaving. Because you know what came out yesterday? Riverside, where I'm from, third, mo 
the third um, greatest population gain in the United States last year. Really? Yeah. 36,000 wow. people moved to where I live. Wow. Only like only Austin and one other city had more. And that's because where I live, the IE, it's really, really cheap. And it's, it's like what I'm reading about to you. And so I think this is sort of an eternal story of the way that people envision California and they envision palm trees, right? Like in Beverly Hills, like the long thin palm trees. What's funny is I have two of those palm trees in my front yard, they belong to the city. My palm trees have been there probably for a hundred years. My house is 110. They're covered with nails and staples and thumbtacks because they're the neighborhood message board. That's really what a palm tree is. It's like a message board, right? So I kept thinking of Johnny Frias eight years ago, like what, is, what does he see? And he grows up, you know, on a cattle ranch in a canyon. I have friends who raise longhorn cattle and, you know, they have plastic cars and they live in the middle of a canyon and there are burrows in the backyard. I wanted to write about those, those guys. And then Jimena came to me because of so much time I spent in Coachella. And I remember so many young women working in the vineyards or in the fields, but I remember meeting somebody who worked in a many spot like this. And she was telling me like the story of how weird it was. So I started writing about her right around the same time. I didn't know how their paths would cross, but the, the shock to me, and you might find this weird, there was really a freeway phantom of the 91 freeway back in 1976 and 77. My friend Cowboy, this guy I went to high school with, he came by about three weeks ago and I said, Cowboy, do you remember when we learned to drive on the 91? Do you remember the freeway phantom? And he's like, oh, that dude would throw rocks. And we were all so scared of him. And I was like, thank goodness, it's not just me. <laughs> so that's how Johnny Frias like, meets up in the canyon with that guy where this terrible murder takes place. Yeah. Once that happened, I have no idea how Matalas joined them, but there she was. And I had written about her taking her two boys on this field trip. And then suddenly all the layers went together. So I say this because I love the way Louise Erdrich's books are polyphonic. Mm -hmm. and so that's what I decided to write about. Like, what is it like to write from many different narrative voices? And it wasn't until I was thinking about this last week, Lydia, that I realized it's because that's how I live. You know, I'm never alone. Like, it's always, my girls always laugh because there's always like, maybe in a day, even during COVID, might be like 20, 25 people come through the porch or the yard or something. So maybe that's the way my brain works fiction-wise too, is that everyone's stories all seem connected, right? Well, I think that, I love the way you describe that. And I, I was trying to think of how to phrase this in a way that doesn't sound like it's actually like insulting the book, because I one of the things that I like so much about it is that it has all of these threads and they are like, they are, you know, wrapped up in ways, but it's not a book. I, f I find it a beautifully meandering book because of the way, like, the stories flow from one to another. And, and so what I say, when I say that it's hard to make that sound like it's, you know, a compliment, but I, I really like that it doesn't feel like at the end, everything has to be like perfectly tied up and knotted together and like the last nail hammered in there and, and it's, it all is this very like complicated machine. It feels, it feels the way you describe your house, like a little bit conversational, just in that we're meeting these people, we're going back and forth. Some of the ways that their lives, some, some of their lives are very connected in ways that, you know, hinge on some, something like a murder, but some of them are more glancing connections or just community connections, just people that know each other because they've known each other for a long time because they're part of the same community. Um, and I think that's captured so beautifully, like how, a, how, a, and the way you describe your house, I'm like, that really makes sense. Um, it's not even just my house, which is funny. It's my whole, I mean, because I've lived in my neighborhood my whole life, you know, I'm 60, right? Yeah. So the, my girls just laugh because they're like, we're not going to Target with mom or like, we're not going to the gas station with dad because you know they're going to run into somebody and then it's going to be two hours and like we have stuff we want to do. Mm -hmm. and so now like during COVID even, everyone comes by the house. So I have these two neighbors up, they're walking all the time because they don't have a car. And, um, you know, they've been walking past for a while, but suddenly like we start talking about this, that, and the other. And um, I'm like, wait, I went to school with your sister, Anna Segovia. And they were like, started crying, these two older men, one is 68 and one is 65. 
and they said she died and I didn't know she had died. And they started crying and said she was the only good one in our family. And then we keep talking the next couple of weeks. And then they're like, wait, you graduated in 78. And I said, yeah. And then I'm like, wait, you guys are Segovias. I said, my, my mother-in-law's cousin married Lucy Segovia and that was my aunt. And they're like, that was our aunt. They're like, Mijo, we're cousins. That's crazy. And I'm like, okay. And then they don't have cars. So now they just send us at the front door and whistle. <laughs> they like need a ride somewhere. And my girls are like, great, we have more cousins. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, that's a story nobody would believe about Southern California, but that's how it works, you know? And then like the Segovias are great storytellers. And that's what I was trying to, to sort of do with Johnny Frias, Manny Delgado, Grief Embers, and their friend Bobby. Yeah. And just this idea of all these men like out at a barbecue and grilling and telling stories, but then there's always that one secret that Johnny holds that nobody yeah. else knows. Well, and I think the I love the way that care caretaking and caregiving is woven into all of the storylines. Um, and just people sharing the space who who have a sort of duty of care to one another, even if they are also in conflict at the same time um, and how that that shows up. And well, one thing I wanted to ask you is that I actually don't think I've read a book yet where reality has like intruded and is so woven up seamlessly into it because it is a COVID novel. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm I'm curious about the, the timeline of that because just like when you, was that in the book when you sold the book or how did how did COVID get wrapped up into everything? Because it's so seamless and seems so integral to how the novel is anyway, but like also COVID is not that old. So just walk me through how that happened. Well, the one story that you and I were talking about briefly before we, we started was, um, there's a story in here called the Perseids, the Lyrids, the Aquarids, and it's, um, the main character is Dante and he's a young kid, he's like 13. Um, and his mom is a nurse, Lorette. And when I, I first wrote that story again, same year, 2009, 2010 wow. is when I started working on that story. And I published it um, as a story and um, uh, it was published in Granta. And I was writing about Grief, who's an animal control officer. And I was writing about copper thieves, copper wire thieves. And you know, back then everything got stolen from our like neighborhood. I mean, they stole so much copper wire, all of our like street lights would go out. Or like, you couldn't really have baseball games. They would steal the bleachers. And that was during the height of like, there was a big sort of meth, you know, a lot of meth going on and a lot of metal, metal thievery and catalytic converters. Girl, that's happening right now, again. Like all, everything's getting stolen again, all the catalytic converters in the neighborhood. And that was like, 2010 and so I'm just thinking like that's crazy so I, I had worked on that story um it was part of it was the chap a chapter in the novel and as COVID came and I was working on this novel to sell in the beginning grief was sad and Dante was sad because Lorette who was a nurse had not come home at all because she was taking care of somebody who had died mm -hmm. in she was taking care of Mary Okay. who's also in the book. Yeah. And then I realized, wait a minute, of course she's not home. And of course they're scared because it's COVID time. And that was a strange thing. I was writing about this big man, Grief Embers, who's an animal control officer. And, you know, my ex-husband is 6'4", and weighs 300, he weighed 325 pounds. And um, all the men in our family are huge. And I wrote about Grief getting COVID and like coming down the hallway on his hands and knees mm -hmm. and swinging his head around and being so feverish and his son Dante freaking out because here's this powerful father and he's been brought so low. But I did that Lydia because I remember when my kids were little, one time I had that, you know the thing where you get the inner ear, mm -hmm. it's like you get the infection of the inner ear yeah. and I couldn't, I kept falling down and I didn't want to scare them. So I just crawled down the hallway to call my dad and the girls came out and saw me they were just mortified. Like I was on my hands and knees and they never forgot it. So that's how weird our fiction brains were. Uh -huh. Well, so that COVID like came in because I realized that that was like the grief that, that they were feeling is because Lorette was in the hospital 
and of course she's a nurse and all there were five nurses in the story yeah right there were five nurses in the story how could COVID not be like a huge part of it and that's what happened is that Dante's story changed a little bit because it was even more serious than it was when his mom just didn't come home because she was taking care of someone else so it it happens you you wrote COVID in before you sold the book Yes, I, I wrote, okay. I was writing COVID in just when I was, just when I was selling the book, which was gotcha. quite fascinating. Um, yeah, and then the timeline was, was interesting because think about Johnny being a California Highway Patrol officer, right, and what that meant for COVID. And then Madalas, you know, when I realized that COVID had happened, like her kids would be home. Yeah. Um, they wouldn't be at school for a certain time. So things did change. They definitely changed. Um, the story that I'm in mean, the chapter called Toto's Mrs. Bunny, which I had also thought about what would it be like if I started that that story, which was really interesting. What's that day? You know, that day that like all the internet goes down and everyone freaks out trying to get their money. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's even more like tempered by the idea of COVID. Like, and so what happens when, when that panic occurs? So that I was already writing in that phase for that story as well. So I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you talk about these sections as stories. Is that how they they kind of start for you in the way that you think about them? Is as stories, and then you figure out how to weave together? No, they were all woven together. I just, I guess, I mean, like narrative, like that particular yeah. narrative. Okay, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. I I had already written about Jimena being at the Medi Spa, and I had already written about Jimena being working for Mrs. Bunny, and so. I knew that that was going to happen. I just, I hadn't, Mrs. Bunny turns out to be a character that comes up for Donnie Frias. And so if, if you think about this triangle, like here's Los Feliz and here's Coachella and here's Santa Ana and like that they could be connected. Mm -hmm. Like that's, again, that's completely believable in my Southern California if yeah. not somebody else's. Like in my Southern California, yeah, like I'll meet somebody. I, I actually, someone called me the other day and they're from Indio. And they were crying and they're like, thank you for writing about us. Like, thank you for writing about, about me, like about wow. me as being like a Chicano woman from Indio. And then we were talking about how, like, if you were from Coachella, you might have family that moved to San Bernardino eventually. It's, just, it's a large geographic area, as you pointed out. It's also true of Northern California, yeah. where you're from. You know, people live in Vacaville and then they come to the Bay Area. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, and I, I didn't really want to like go in this direction, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested. And in, I feel like when I read this book, it coincides with some like larger cultural conversations that are happening in publishing. And I'm just like, people like, there, I, I feel like there was a there was a viral thing a couple weeks ago where an author was sort of asked like, do people have permission to write certain things? And 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 then everyone's like, people have permission, and it's like, you know, that's a silly question because there are people writing all kinds of communities that are, in some ways, their community, but in many ways, not at all. Um, and I think that Mecca is a really wonderful example of that, um, and how there is there is actually not like a, a shadowy network of people saying writers can't write about people who don't look exactly like them or sound the way that they do. Um, I guess that was a comment more than a question. <laughs> um, um, but I guess, so when you're writing, you are writing about a lot of people that you know in the California that you know, but there's also a lot of history in the book, a lot of history that seems like very deeply researched. What does your research process look like? And how do you kind of follow? I think, I believe in your acknowledgements, you thank some librarians. Um, how, do you, how do you track down sort of the deep history that undergirds a lot of these communities that you're writing about in the present day? So that's also a funny question because that's most research is just hanging out. Yeah. Like I went to school with the Trujillos and um, the Trujillos are a family that kind of um, mirrors Johnny Frias's family. Um, so I'm, I'm from Riverside and right next to Riverside is Colton and then there's San Bernardino. But between there's this, there are all these little canyons, right? And mm -hmm. um, my former student, Alex Espinosa wrote a novel called um, Stillwater Saints. And he said it in this place called Aguamanta. Right. 
So like when you leave Riverside and you're going to San Bernardino, you have Salvador, High Grove, La Placita, Aguamanza, Colton. Like there's just all these back ways because we all grew up in the orange groves. So my brother grew marijuana when he was really young. And so like there were all the back ways. We never went the right way. We always went the back way because that was the way that he always went when he was making his deliveries. And I mean, he was doing that when he was 15 and I was 18. So just like all the people that we grow up with live in all like these small, tiny places. So I, again, the Trujillo family came to California in 1843. The first Trujillos came from over the Santa Fe Trail. They came from Abiquio, New Mexico, but they weren't Spanish. They were Apaches who had been captured by the Spanish forced into Catholicism and the Trujillo, the, the patriarch, um, Antonio Trujillo, he came because he was able to watch cattle before the missions arrived. You know what I mean? Like, like just think, I'm going to school at the Trujillos. And this, this came to me, oh, again, this moment happened where I had a friend named Leti Espinosa, our, our girls played tennis together. And one day Leti said to me, you know, I was like, she's from Santa Ana. And she said, I was at the store and this woman came up to me. She's like, you need to go back to Mexico. And this was like in 2009. And Leti's like, I've never been to Mexico. My family's fifth generation Santa Ana. So I said to her, like, where are you from? And the lady was like, well, my people are from Wisconsin. And he's like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so like, this was a conversation that I had, but the Trujillo family, like, that's just, that, that history is already there in my mind from growing up. But yes, I definitely love the way the librarians remind us of, you know, like what route they took or how many horses were stolen. And then there's another part to that, which is again, that Johnny Frias's mom comes with the Anza party. So a mile and a half from my house is this marker over the San Juan River, it's called the Anza crossing. And Juan, Juan Batista de Anza, they, they were Spanish, they left Mexico, first overland crossing to Mission San Gabriel, which before it was even a mission. 1774. Well, my brother-in-law was working security guarding like cranes from the city from getting stolen. He, he had a little truck. He was midnight security at Anza Crossing. So I used to go bring him a like, sandwich and cake. He would tell me stories about what happened at that haunted crossing. So my research is much more hanging out <laughs> as always. But what was really helpful was to go to my librarian friends and say, okay, wait a minute. How many people were in the party? I just wanted to know how many people crossed the river. So Anza is the name of Johnny's mom's ancestor. And what she points out is it wasn't just the Spanish. The Anza people would never have made it if they didn't have the indigenous people from Mexico that guided them through. That was what I wanted to write about. Yeah. Um, but yes, all of it came from nighttime security because people will literally steal a crane, <laughs> like a crane, and a water buffalo, you know, the big water buffalo trucks. So my mm -hmm. brother-in-law who's six six and weighs 385, he was like guarding the crane. And we would go keep him company. That's where that came from. Um, well, so also the in the section that Susan mentioned previously, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, uh, we're talking about the theft of like bleachers and catalytic converters and copper. That leads to like really um, upsetting, <laughs> upsetting, moments that is also just so like striking and also involves palm trees but the palm trees are made out of metal um in any case i really i need everyone to read this book and and meet some of the people that um susan is talking about and who she's written so beautifully and and the places that she has just um i feel like memorialized in such a beautiful way um i'm gonna ask one more question and then if people people should start dropping your questions in the q a section um and I will get to them. Um, but I did, I wanted to ask, so this, you know, this is not your first rodeo. You have written a number of books, um, have had an incredible career in publishing. Um, what are your, do you have any sort of, <laughs> do, you have, do you have reflections of that? I'm curious, like how, how it's changed, um, what feels different to you? What has surprised you about um, how, about the, the new books publication process, just anything you wanna kind of share about like the journey that you've had uh, as a writer? 
Yeah, especially for those people in the audience who are writing, which that's always our fun thing to, to think about. Um, it's just the way I would say what I really have always loved is the way medium and small presses have kept a lot of publishing alive, even for all this time. I was really young when I got married. I was young when I went to graduate school. I was only 22. I was already married. I went off to graduate school. I got to study with James Baldwin and Jane Nugaborn and, and Julius Lester. And so, you know, I married my, the guy I met freshman year. Um, he was a correctional officer at night in Massachusetts. Uh, he went to work at night. So I taught during the day. I also cleaned houses. That was my first job there in I cleaned the house for a professor at Smith College who treated me really badly, but I'd been cleaning houses all my life, so it didn't feel any different. And at night, I had a little milk crate and I had my Smith Corner typewriter on it. I mean, we had a mattress on the floor and um, we lived in Mary Student Housing. So that's where I began writing my first book, Aqua Boogie. But I graduated, I was not quite 24. We drove directly back home. You know, it was um, a recession year, it was 1984. I got a job teaching at Job Corps. Um, I just wrote an essay about that because that's really when I, I was teaching at Job Corps and that's when I realized I had to teach my students to speak American. Like not, I shall go to the store, but I'm gonna go to the store. Mm -hmm. And my students were, um, you know, they were Cambodian, Vietnamese, Laotian, Hmong, Ethiopian, but also like former Crips and Bloods from LA and a lot of guys from San Francisco. So I was writing at night I was working in the day and it did take me seven years to even try to send anything out because I always thought who would want to read about my people. And that is how I felt that I was writing about these same people, many of them. I wrote a character named Darnell who was a, a young black firefighter that, that long ago. And that was my brother-in-law who ended up becoming a security guard. He used to be a firefighter. Yeah. So I started writing those stories but I didn't send anything out till I was about 28. And um, I ended up getting my first book published when I was 29 and I already had a kid and I was pregnant, my second kid. And I was published by Milkweed Editions. Um, so I love the small presses. And then, then I was with the big press, Hyperion, which is owned by Disney. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is I brought up Louise Erdrich because she always, she continues to write about her same characters in her same community. Yeah. And I do the same thing. Like I've never, I still am writing about Darnell who was in that very first book, you know, he shows up in High Wear Moon and he shows up like again later. And I, I cannot, I cannot say anything except for that when you, when you think about some of us as American writers, um, Edward P. Jones said, Jones does the same thing for his characters that are based in Washington, DC. Um, if you just think about the way some writers operate, we're always trying to write our, our landscape and like our place. So I feel like it's been harder for publishing now. I don't know what you think, Lydia, but I think publishing is such a conglomeration. It's, 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 it's huge. And then there are all these great presses. But I have to say that working with my editor at FSG, Jacqueline Howard, is a third generation Californian. It was like a dream come true, you know, <laughs> to have somebody who was totally down for having Spanish in the book or having, you know, a character like, like Mary's son, Tenerife, be a baller. Yeah. And, so a lot of it, I think, if I'm talking to people who are writing, it really is about connecting with the right editor, whether it's a big press or a small press or a medium-sized press. It's about having somebody who's like, who doesn't say, no, they can't speak Spanish, you know, or like, no, this is too hard. Like, you can't make people read about, you know, someone stealing copper wire and becoming electrocuted. But that That's what happens. And so I feel like I've had a great time publishing with all of those places and um I think it's actually imperative is the word James Bowen it's the one who taught me that word he said it is imperative that you write about about your place and I was so young when he said that I still feel it's exactly as imperative right now and it's like our job to make sure that the writers coming up feel that it's imperative to write about you know Salinas or Coachella or Madison, Iowa, or like a tiny town in West Texas, or like I loved reading, I really enjoyed reading um, about Pawtucket, Rhode Island in J.M. Holmes, right? Or like there's just all these great regional writers. I love regional fiction.
Yeah, I mean, I'd say place is one of the things that I look for more than anything in books. And I, I don't know, I, I'm like luxuriate as long as you want in describing things. I will read it all day long. I don't care what the place is. I just, I love that feeling of, of assuredness that you can get from writers who know their place really well. Um, right. And That's what you did with the Golden State, you know, you were, when they were on their journey, that was a very specific NorCal, it was a very specific <laughs> like way that Alturas looked and that those those back roads looked and mm -hmm. the sort of abandoned buildings looked. And that was definitely your place that you were writing about. I always loved that. Oh, it's a very, you. it's not just the Golden State, it's a very dry golden place, don't mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, yeah, it's very particular landscape. Um, it is. Well, and I, I'm, I just one, I'm sorry, I said that was my last question. This is just, I just wanted to ask people if um, you have not read, she had a rave review in the New York Times um, by Caribbean Fragosa. And I, what I loved about the review is that she, that she talked about the language aspect, um, how your characters are using language and, you know, many of them are bilingual, trilingual, speaking mixtures of languages and, um, it's so beautifully done in the book and I love that that was like called out and put in the paper of record. Um, <laughs> it's uh, true. I mean, the one thing that I loved writing about Johnny is that when he first starts working, he's, he's navigating, you know, between Spanish and English. And like so many of us who have a parent who spoke a different language, like you just, you, you approach the language in a different way. My mom learned to speak English from listening to Vin Scully do Dodger broadcasts. Like that's the <laughs> legend in our household. But that's true of thousands of people in, in Southern California. Yeah, that's a legend of Southern California that people listen to Vin Scully because his enunciation was so precise <laughs> that people will be like from Peru or you know from Shanghai and they listen to Vin Scully. But with Johnny, he wants to learn American, and so he learns from some guy who came in the Oklahoma Dust Bowl, right? <laughs> and so think about like all those guys. I'll, I'll never forget, you know, people. You'd meet them old cowboy guys, they'd be like, well, you're getting pie-eyed there down at the at the saloon. And you'd be like, what are you talking about? But like pie-eyed. And then this morning, my son-in-law who's from Nigeria and my daughter, they were doing the crossword, the New York Times crossword puzzle, because mm -hmm. that's how they were rolling, right? And it was like another word for, for getting lit. And I was like, well, there you go. There's pie-eyed and there's lit and it was tipsy. <laughs> so American, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. There's, yeah, it's a, a rich, a rich tapestry. <laughs> um, so do we have questions? Please put that, I'm checking the Q&A. There are no questions. So I'm going to need someone to <laughs> We have appalled everyone. <laughs> pony up and, and ask a question. Um, I have more questions I can ask if no one does, but um, <laughs> I... Well, let's talk about what you're working on now. What are you working on? Oh, um, <laughs> I just finished a book. Um, well, so I finished like I finished a draft of a book, and um, I, it's actually I'm a little horrified to say this after what we were just talking about, but I wrote about some places that I have not seen because I was writing in the pandemic, and I was writing about a state of mind. It's it's like. Um, when I was writing The Golden State, I wanted to talk about a certain place and a relationship with that place. And when I was writing this book, I wanted to talk about still a relationship to a place, but it was not a place that I actually knew, which felt very risky and strange. I now have the opportunity to go to the places that I wrote about, so yeah. I'm going to do that. But um, it was really good. I also, everything was different. I wrote in like the third person and the past tense and... Um, but yeah, so I, I, I will, uh, offline, I will discuss this with you <laughs> more, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just- I'm glad to hear it. I'm yeah. glad that you got to write during pandemic because for me, there were a few times when, when I, was, I was writing things about like this character, Lorette. Mm -hmm. I'm still working, I'm working on the next book and um, this book ends in a specific place that, that the readers We'll find out if, if, if they buy it. And um, I I was appalled when a couple of people told me that magazine editors said, oh, we don't want, we don't want to publish anything about COVID. Like we're tired of COVID and we don't, like people are living COVID, so we don't want to publish any fiction about COVID. And I thought, but that's such a luxury 
when people say I've never met anyone who had COVID, I mean that I'm I'm always happy for them. But like my neighborhood was decimated by COVID, and in fact, one of my neighbors died last month. I'm sorry. In in his house, my neighbor across the street, and um, he had had diabetes, and so yeah, he was vaccinated, and my ex husband got COVID in November, and he almost died, and yet he was also vaccinated, and yet there I was calling the ambulance, and they were taking him away. And he still walked forward. He just we just took the oxygen tank. COVID has been so dramatically hard on like communities with men like the one I live around that I've lost so many people to COVID this time that I can't think of anything else I would rather like try to explore. But also my neighbor was full of nurses. Like a bunch of my neighbors are nurses. And so they would come by after their shift and they would end up walking past my house because I live on a corner and they'd be like drinking some wine out of a solo cup. And they would tell me what they saw that day. And um, the tenderness with which they talked about the people they'd spent 12 hours taking care of when you think about it, Lydia, right? Like, so that's, I'm writing about the nurses now and still writing about like what happens to us during COVID. And what happened in SoCal is people started street racing and driving like crazy. And then other people are nurses working in hospitals. And I'm at just this juxtaposition of being like caged up. It's been crazy to watch, you know, what our human reactions are. And then the animals taking over during COVID. Right. That's been crazy too. So I don't know. I'm not done writing about it yet. And no, I'll be interested to see what we both come up with next. Right. No, you have to write about it. Well, and, and I, and I was actually, I was really grateful reading those parts of the book because like, it feels like people really want to move on. Um, but like nobody has processed like what has been going on and what is still happening. And, and i and the book really brought me back, especially the parts describing the nurse and just the protocols that people were taking, sleeping outside, sleeping like in trailers, being away. I mean, it. so I think that is a really important part of the book. We have questions now. I want to make sure I, see that. I get, That's good. get to them. Okay. So first, anonymous attendee says, your book, I've Been in Sorrow's Kitchen, is one of my favorites. How did you get the idea for the main female character? Is she based on someone you know or knew? Oh, that's such a great question. I think about, I thought about that while I was describing my first book. So when I wrote Aqua Boogie, there was a character in there named Big Ma. And um, I wrote a memoir called In the Country of Women. That's what Lydia and I were talking about previously as well. So my mother-in-law, Alberta Sims, um, there's a picture of of her somewhere like right near here in my daughter's apartment. My mother-in-law's mother, Daisy, she had a boarding house, like an old school boarding house where people would leave the South and they would end up living in Riverside, California in this boarding house. And she had a woman living in her house called Big Ma. And when we were younger, Big Ma was six feet tall and she was very dark skinned and she would come down my mother-in-law's street and she would be holding a newspaper torch and she would come and smoke out the wasp nests in the eaves underneath your roof. And she would light the torch, blow it out, smoke them out, and then take the wasp nest and she used the larva to go fishing with in the salt and sea. Like that was just, and she went fishing with, with um, my future husband's grandparents in the salt and sea. There were lots of black people that went to the salt and sea at that time to go fishing. And that, that was the inspiration for Marietta, the main character in I've Been in Sorrow's Kitchen was all the stories that I had heard about Big Ma and about her life growing up in um, South Carolina. And her son-in-law, LB, just passed away. He was 88. Dwayne and I just passed by his house um, last week. We were worried because his house was empty and there's homeless people living in it. But her son-in-law, LB, is who told me some of those amazing stories too. He saw his grandmother once taking a bath in a tin tub on their farm in South Carolina. And he was 10 and she stood up to dry off and she had scars Mm. all across her back, like the famous pictures that you see. But he told me this, you know, about four years ago, like sitting in his porch in real time. And he said, that was my grandma, that was my grandma. So those were all things that I had been writing about when I wrote, I've been in Star's Kitchen because I'm so tiny. And I mean, I'm so invisible and everyone tells me their life story and yet doesn't remember my face. I wanted to write about what it, would have been like to be Big Ma, where she was so memorable and 
even as a woman being six feet, what that felt like. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so Bill asks, uh, when it comes to integrating subjects like COVID in your writing, how did you decide you'd had enough addressed in your book of what was happening given the constant evolution of events as you wrote? And there's a little bit of a follow-up. Um, how do you decide you're done, especially when you've been living with these characters so long and I imagine continue living with them even after publication? That's a great question. <laughs> it's, really, it, it's really hard for me to underestimate how much I miss them when I'm done. Like, actually, when I finished I've Been in Sorrow's Kitchen, which was published in 1992, I dreamed for a year still about all the characters in that book. And some of them then showed up like in later books. But the COVID thing is just, it was so difficult. It was so hard for me to write that, chap that chapter with Grief and Lorette getting COVID and how scared Dante must have been, how scared it must. So I, I kept truthfully being obsessed by how many children I know, like both parents got COVID, you know, and then where did they go? They had to go stay with an aunt. But at that time, you're 10 or you're 12, like, what do you even think? about the possibility that you might not see your parents again. And then again, with my friends coming by to talk to me who were nurses, there was all of this on my mind. So I think it was more like I just absorbed all that fear and it was easy for me to write from the point of view of Dante mm -hmm. about being so scared and about that. But I'm not done writing about COVID yet for sure. Um, the book ends in a very specific way in the Fotello Valley, but um, I'm still working on that right now. I just finished another chapter in my next book and Lorette is the main character. It's called Desperado from the Eagles song, Desperado. And Lorette is, if you, when you read this book, you'll see that Lorette's all about singing. She had wanted to be in musical theater mm -hmm. and she's a nurse. And so all of a sudden, man, I'm writing this story about two months ago and I realized it's another chapter. And Lorette is being asked to sing to people when they're intubated and they can't communicate. And she asks their family what's their favorite song, and then she sings to them at night because she works the night shift. Mm. It hasn't left me at all yet. The the when Dante is is quarantining in the room, basically by himself, and has shitty Wi-Fi and just looking at things on the phone, and people are leaving food for him, and different grown-ups are rotating through and taking care of him as much as best they can. I think that's such a beautiful part of the book, and. It just makes you think about all the stories like that from COVID of people who just had to help each other out in these really hard and um, really generous ways. Um, that was my whole neighborhood is that all, everybody was trying to take care of each other and cooking for each other. And then we're still doing it because again, my neighbor just passed away last month and he died at home. So we watched his body getting taken out and that was really hard. Um, it's hard when you watch someone leave a house it's different from someone who dies in the hospital. So we were pretty thrown up for like about a week, couldn't think of anything else. But yeah, now we're cooking for her. He left behind a senior in high school and a sophomore in high school. Oh my God. So just, right, and he was had been their coach the whole time. So I'm so it, sorry. That's, that's, it's, it's not left me at all. So it's a good question, thank you. Um, and then Kat says, this is a fascinating conversation. I love listening and I apologize for not having a question. No apologies, <laughs> no apologies required. Um, we have time, I think for one more, if anyone's got anything. We're gonna... sorry, we only talked about sad and terrifying things, right? <laughs> There's also funny things and beautiful things. And when you're talking about, um, fi you know, think finding out that your cousins with someone, I really liked um, the part where, Madalas is meets a new beau and they're talking about how they realize they have a connection on this um, tribal land of the families that then they're like wait are we cousins <laughs> um, and and just girl yeah. you know what's you know what's so funny about that for my for this week because I'm with Duffy my middle kid oh my gosh we just want to watch Bridgerton at night right because <laughs> she's been she's watched it but she's been saving it for me because I've been working so hard so yeah, like look at Bridgerton, everyone's like, wait, are we cousins? Are we first cousins? Are we fourth cousins? I'm like, how is my neighborhood still that? <laughs> it totally is. Mm. Well, big families, big families. Yeah. Um, 
All right, one last question, huh? Looking forward to reading Mecca. That, um, love it. You're going to love it. It's. I can't wait for you to meet the people in this book. And we didn't even talk about Mrs. Bunny. <laughs> Mrs. Bunny is very I'll just memorable. say this to you about Mrs. Bunny is that my youngest daughter, Rosette, was living in Hollywood after I was done with this book. And we were taking a walk. And she didn't know anything about the book at all. She's 26. And um, I tried to describe to her, I'm like, so do my character, Mrs. Bunny, is this old, but she makes herself up to look this old. And mm -hmm. that's like, no one would ever do that. I'm like, that's the point. Like, who's <laughs> in Hollywood and tries to make themselves look 30 years older than they are? And then she's like, oh, you're right. That's such a good way to hide. And I was like, it worked out well for her. Yes, so it was truly a very, it was a truly novel in all ways. Um, I was not expecting that. And it was amazing. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about Mrs. Yeah. Bunny. <laughs> Um, well, Susan, thank you so much for, for talking with us and um, for uh, not being mad that we accidentally wore the same shirt. <laughs> and, um, I don't even know my shirt, girl. I told you this is the same shirt. It's super nice. But I remember when she bought it from Goodwill. My, my children are good Goodwill shoppers. We, that's how they were. Like, I had to shop at Goodwill when I was a kid because we were so poor. So I'm kind of grateful that my kids are still like, hey, we can keep shopping at Goodwill. Like, that yeah. works out for us. It's, it's, it's great environmentally friendly um and it is yeah but we was doing it before it was cool we were doing it when it was not cool <laughs> so we're super glad it's cool now yeah. yes very cool um well i love the novel so much and i'm just grateful to you for talking with me about it and thank you thanks for taking the time to do it i really appreciate it and thanks to pals i'm so sad i couldn't be there in person because oh my ex-husband loves him some pals because you know what i normally <laughs> buy all these years I've come to Powell's, you have an amazing selection of the history of guns. And that's oh, what sure. the discussion is, the history of guns. And so I always would bring him home. He's like, you go into the bookstore in, in Portland, right? <laughs> You're going to bring me two books about the history of guns. And I'd be like, yes. And this time I'm like, no, I cannot bring you those. We will have to order them for him as always. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So... Well, Susan and Lydia, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. Thank you for the excellent conversation. And everyone out there, um, thanks for joining us also. And please go get a copy of Mecca and uh, of palace.com. And while you're there, check out our upcoming virtual events and our live events, which are coming up this Friday. And so we look forward to seeing you at something. And uh, thank you both so much again for joining us. So thanks for having have us. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for taking the time. It was my pleasure, truly.